Praise God. So let me greet each and every one in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me take the opportunity to wish all of you, pray for you if I've not yet done so before, a happy new year, a prosperous new year, a new year filled with all the blessings of Jesus. Let me welcome our new sister to her first Bible study as a child of God. Praise God. And let me welcome the newest grandma in our assembly. I'm not going to call her the names. <laughs> and we just want to give God thanks that our sister, our daughter, our very dear friend had a safe passage. And um, now I can officially tell you that the population of Jamaica is one more than it was a few days ago. Praise God. I will not say anything. I will leave that to other people to um, give you the details. Amen. Praise God. Let me thank Sister Jody for holding forth while we set up. And without further ado, we're going to launch into our study for this evening. Praise God. We're looking at a study in the book of Jude. Praise God. And... Uh, we're going to take some time to go through the book of Jude um, over the next couple of weeks. Amen. It's a very interesting book. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, inspire your servant and open the understanding of your people that we may hear, appreciate, understand, and be willing to live by what you have revealed to us. We thank you for everyone who is here and those who may be on their way. Let your will be done tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So the book of Jude, as we know, is one of the shortest, if not the shortest book in the Bible. One chapter, 25 verses. And I'm sure most, if not all of us here tonight, will know verse 24, verses 24 and 25. It's our benediction quite regularly praise god but we kind of want to put that in context praise god against i don't know we can get this level does it make a difference if i can get something just to stick under this corner here and kind of lift it up here can you all see it praise god so we're talking about the book of jude fight for this faith Spread the light. Amen. Praise God. Because uh, we're going to find that the book of Jude is inspiring us to accept, appreciate, and hold fast to that which we know to be true. But also to take the opportunity to spread it to others. Amen. Praise God. So over the other side of the next few weeks. We have not much time tonight because of our late start, but let us get right into it. Amen. Jude 1 to 25. Let's all stand. We're going to be reading together. Praise God. After 2, 1, 2. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh 
are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, disputes about the body of Moses. Does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But thee speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Warn to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and run greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perish in the gain, saying of Kor. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clothes they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withers, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the root. Raging waves of the sea, foaming on their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And eating also the seven from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told them that they should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present your faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior with glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Give yourself a clap. Amen. If you have never done it before, you have just read one book of the Bible from start to finish. <laughs> You may be seated. Praise God. And so, we're going to look through this book under six headings. We're going to look at the urgency of the call from verses 1 to 3. We're going to look at the deception of the enemy in verse 4. We're going to look at the nature of the enemy's attack and strategy in verses 5 to 11. We're going to look at defense of the saints, verses 12 to 16. We're going to look at the surety of our victory in verses 17 to 23. And we're going to look at the strength of our army in verses 24 and 25. And let me just save you a few um, gigs of memory, Sister Jody. It's going to be put up tonight. <laughs> I saw you taking pictures there. Praise God. Now, in our last study, we looked at <coughs> we looked at the art of war, and if you remember, we said that there are three, three stages in a war. Anybody remember the three stages? And remember, there were three stages in war. What do we call a stage when you go into the enemy's territory and nullify their defenses or their strong weapons? Exactly. 
What do we call that stage in, 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 in war language? You go into the enemy's territory and you look for their most potent weapons or their strongest defenses. It's called invade and hold. Right? And you remember that I made reference to the movie, um, The Guns of Navarone, where these British and American commanders had to go on an island that the Germans used to defend the straits that run, bet that run between Greece and Spain as the Allies prepared to invade Europe. Right? Praise God. Then the second stage where you're sending reinforcements and additional um, ordnance, which would include ammunition, armory, and supplies for the invading force. Anybody remember the name at the second stage? So you invade and hold, you nullify or neutralize or diminish the enemy's capabilities. But remember, we said that those who do that because they have to travel light, because they have to travel um, incognito, they have to travel where they can't be easily detected, they don't care a lot of ordnance. So they go in, but then somebody so come in now and, and to give them what do they call a second state? Supply and replenish. Amen. And the last stage where you completely take over and establish your supremacy in that area. You sanitize and occupy. And remember I said, even in a service. So when I came in here this evening, I heard the, the prayers. I heard the worship. We are clearing out. We are neutralizing the enemy because we're going to have a Bible study. And we want persons to understand. So we have to neutralize the distractions, neutralize the deception, neutralize old ideas that we may have gotten otherwise so that the word of God can find fertile ground. So like you're going to plant, Brother Troy, you're going and you dig out the weeds and all those. So, so when you plant your crops, amen? So that's the first day. That's why we always have prayer meetings before every service. That's the invade and hold. That's where we clear out the demons, chase out the devils, nullify the deception of Satan. So even if he comes into the service before, afterwards, he is weakened. Then we supply and replenish. And so we bring in the worship, we bring in the word, and so on. And this is the strategy This is the, that Jude follows. So it starts by restating our purpose, exposing the enemy and what they're doing. Then it talks about how we're going to bring in and build up ourselves. And the last part now is saying we're going to own the show unto him who is able to what? keep us from falling. We run things. We are going to in that area, in that life, in that household. Amen. Praise God. So those are the three, invade and hold, supply and replenish, sanitize and occupy. Praise God. And this last one, you're going to see that it places some emphasis. Because if you remember, when Israel occupied the promised land, they were told to utterly drive out all the people. But they, instead of doing that, they kept them as slaves. Amen. To the extent that at one point, um, Joshua went and made a, 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 an agreement with a group of them. Without uh, The Bible said, took their victuals, their food, and did not ask counsel at the, mount of, at the mouth of God. And God said, you're going to become what? Thorns in your flesh. That's why God was so upset when he told King Saul to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. And Saul did not. He said, every living thing, the pregnant mother, the suckle and the breast, kill them all up. No, they, they let nothing remain. I was coming home this evening, I was listening to Beyond the Headlines. 
And Dion Jack Miller was speaking with a doctor. And he was talking about sepsis, sep, sepsis. Uh, I wish one of the doctors were here. But he said, what tends to happen when you have a, a bacterial infection? The doctor gives you something. They say, take this for 14 days. So you take it for five days and you feel better. And what do you do? You stop. There are some bacteria left there. And what they are doing, they are feeding on the weakened antibiotic. Because the bio, how the antibiotic works, it starts to take it and the strength goes down. Then you take another one to, and it goes down. Then you take another one. So if you allow it to get to get to a point where it deteriorates and the bacteria are still there, they build up a resistance to the bacteria. And then by the time it, you, you, you start to get sick again, the drug that you got the last time can't work because the new set of bacteria has developed a resistance. So the sanitize and occupy is where you go into, when you go to the city, you go from house to house. And that is why Israel is saying we can't stop what we're doing. Because anytime we stop, Hamas is going to just get stronger. They're going to dig deeper. They're going to become more entrenched. And the next time, instead of destroying 10 houses to get them, we're going to destroy 100. Amen. Praise God. So all three stages... You can't just jump into the war in the middle of with the enemy having some heavy artillery. So you have to go in and take them out. It works in our families. Don't wait until our children are preteens and teens before we start to try to get them to serve God. From there in the womb, get the word of God in. Supply and replenish. Yes, you may initially go in, but if you go in and you don't get back up and reinforcement, the enemy will, after a time, rebuild. Amen? Praise God. And so, as we look at this book, in verse 1, it starts, Jude has served. Now, who is Jude? And as you see, they say many commentators believe that the writer is actually Judas, the brother of Christ Jesus, not the one who betrayed him. Right? If you look in Matthew 13, verse 55, you see they mention the brothers of Jesus, and one of them is called Judas. No, I'm not sure whether the name was shortened to differentiate from the betrayer. But commentators say it is likely he deliberately shortened his name to disguise or de-emphasize his relationship to Jesus. Because, of course, if you are Jesus' brother, persons may want to place a greater importance on what you say than if you are not. Amen? So it is believed that he, he, he actually shortened the name to distract attention. Amen? And he called himself the brother of James. Now, if you look, there are two Jameses mentioned in the Bible. There's James and John, the sons of Zebedee. But there is no indication of Zebedee having another son called Jude. So it is believed that this James is the other James who is the brother of the Lord. If you look, I think, in Acts chapter 12, I think it is, they killed the brother of the, all right, so it is believed that he is um, the brother of Christ, but he identified himself as a servant and therefore he is saying that notwithstanding my biological relationship to Jesus as a half brother, the more important relationship is my servanthood. Amen? It is not your position in the United Pentecostal Church that determines how good a Christian you are. It's the relationship to Jesus. The bishop 
that does not have a servant's heart is not as loved by God as the person in the pew who loves the Lord with all his or her heart and mind and soul. The primary love must not be to our pastor or to our assembly or to our organization. Our primary love must be to Jesus. Amen. So he's saying, I want to be known as a servant. I may be the son of the pastor or the bishop. I may be the husband or wife of the leader. That is not important if I am not a servant of Jesus. And this mindset is what is going to cause us. Because later we see what the enemy's strategy this mindset, if you fill a cup with water, there is no space to put in anything else. It's already full. If our hearts and minds are filled with the love of Jesus, the things of the world will not find ways to attract us so easily. Amen. Praise God. Now, the next thing he said, he says, sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. And many persons see this as some vindication of the Trinitarian doctrine, when actually it is an indication of the progression of our relationship with Christ. I don't care how much you tithe. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how much you read the Bible. Until you have re received the sanctification that comes through obedience to the gospel. When the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses our sin. And the Holy Ghost replaces or takes uh, uh, um, precedence over our natural carnal, carnal nature. We are not of God. That's why the Bible says, if a man hath not the spirit of Christ, is none of his. Amen. We can't say we are God's until we are led by the spirit of God. And we can't be led by the spirit of God if the temple has not been cleansed by the blood of Christ because God is not going to dwell in an unholy vessel. Can anyone, Jesus asks, put wine in an old vessel? Baptism in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin and the infilling of the Holy Ghost is what brings the sanctification being set apart for the service of God. When God washes you and fills you, he says, all right, this one is mine. I'm going to use him or her the way I see fit. But because the person now has a servant mind, if God's way of using him or her is to place that person at the door to greet, and that person never gets a chance to come on the pulpit to use the mic, the love of God holds that person there. And let me tell you something. It is this mindset that holds organizations together. When I don't have to be the bishop to want to work for the United Pentecostal Church of Jamaica. I don't need to be the pastor to love Pentecostal lighthouse and want to see the saints here grow and progress. It is the same thing that holds marriages together. When you get to the point where you know that this man or this woman is the best person on the planet for you, then you start, you stop looking at imperfection because you know that as we say in the old days, no better no dajan shop. But when you don't, you are not filled with a love for the person, there is a tendency to look around. 
Because you wonder if boy me not like how she behave. Me go see me can find somebody who. Praise God. So we have to be sanctified. But the sanctification is the first step. We are now preserved, not by Christ, but in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that's what? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are seated in heavenly places where? In Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus is not a pious mindset, a holier than thou attitude. In Christ Jesus is where our entire being is consumed by the desire to serve Christ. Everything we do must be what will bring honor and glory. Or at the very least will not bring this honor to his name. Amen. It's not about how eloquent sermons or Bible studies we can teach. It's not about how well we can sing. It's not about how many people know us. It's not about having our names on the back of vehicles, driving around and, people, and having two and five million subscribers to our page. It's about having a mindset that says, Jesus is my all in all. There's a song we used to sing in the old days. I said, I'm wrapped up, tied up, Tangle up in Jesus. Jesus is my all in all. Preserved. And it is then that the calling comes. And many people have the thing backwards. Amen. Many persons have it backwards. Because they believe that while, our, 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 while the gifts and calling are without repentance, many persons think the calling can come before the sanctification, or before the, 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 the preservation. How can you utilize a vessel that you don't have under your control? How can you drink from a cup that you don't have in your hand? If somebody is going to feed me with a cup of very hot tea, I'm going to be very scared. But if I'm the one holding the cup, I know just how much to tilt it. And you know, if you used to drink the old time chocolate, you hold a cup about half and you suck hard. And you see the chocolate fly across the, the, the thing into your mouth, right? Anybody know that? And then when it burns, you tug it. So the calling begins with God's setting apart for God's use. Then we get consumed in Christ. And then we got, God says, okay, I can start using this one. So the call to salvation is freely offered to all. But the, but the security of salvation rests in the earthly work of Jesus to bring atonement. Yes, sister. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. It means that if God calls you to be a pastor, when he called you, you were qualified. And God is not going to say, boy, i sorry. If you choose to walk away, God, it doesn't mean that you were not qualified when God calls you. And many persons think that it means that you will always have the calling. You will always have the talent. You will always have the talent. I've never seen any person who used to sing walk out of church and just lost the ability to sing. I've seen many musicians walk away from church bands and end up in secular dance, um, dance bandstands. They still have their talent. But they have lost their calling. But God is not going to say, boy, I should not have. When he called you. And if you 
your ministry brings someone to Christ and you backslide, God not will send them out with you. Because what you did while you were under his control still remains. <coughs> Amen. So the call to salvation is offered to all. But it's only after we have accepted the salvation that we receive our call to service. I think I left out peace. It should be our call to service. Which is distinctly different to this doctrine of predestination. Which says God called you to service and whatever you do, you're going to come and serve. Amen. I've always thought about to have a rich young ruler. The Bible said Jesus, looking at him, loved him. But when the young man heard what he had to do to receive the eternal life for which he sought, he went away sorrowful. And Jesus didn't say, come back here, my son. Come, right, come, come, come. He said, how oh, hard it is for rich people to enter into the kingdom. I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle. And I, I know many people will tell you that in Israel there was a place there at that time called the eye of the needle and all of that. They may or may not be. Just like I have heard that there was a place called the valley of the shadow of death. But to me, I just look at a regular needle. I can't even get a piece of thread through a needle these days. Yes, Sister Catherine. There is one place where Jesus said, so it is with them that are rich in this earth goods, but are not rich towards God. If somebody can have a, a Bible, you can, with a concordance, can look over that quotation. It is not the wealth that keeps us from God. The Bible says, riches increase, set not your heart. Because God does that inherit your, God does that inhabit your wallet. God inhabits your heart. So if your wallet is full of money, but your heart has space for God, God in his use of you is going to take this money and use it for his glory. But when the money fills your heart, God has no place to occupy. Can God not live in a tenement yard? Praise the Lord, brother Shad. Somebody said their hand up a while ago. Brother Jason. I refer to the people that we got to be rich and wealthy. Have pool in them. You have to be swimming at the pool. And to be honest, them very miserable. It, it's just a peace to have Jesus. Me say, them say, where do me say, I'm just pray and go to my bed. I sleep like a baby. And I don't want to be rich. I just want to be rich in Christ because you see, what I want, <laughs> some of the most some of the most miserable people I believe is people who is very rich and wealthy. Mis now watch the big house where them live and the big cars where them have an open land where them have now. You're surprised if you know that they have that trade place with you. <laughs> Miserable. Praise God, Sister Manning. As I was saying earlier about Abraham and being rich, one of the points I noted, and I'm going through and I'm noting every one of them. If you notice, every time the Lord continually blessed Abraham, Abraham, or and Abraham as his name was changed, he set up an altar. So his heart was with God at every stage. He, the, the riches was not his focus. That just happened, right? But his heart was with Jesus because verses upon verses it says that he built an altar unto God. So he was, once you have an altar, when you go to the altar, your heart is broken. You want Jesus. You want, his focus was definitely not the riches. His focus was Jesus. His focus was the Lord God Almighty. Luke chapter 12 is the chapter I'm looking for. The story of the man whose vineyards brought home 
whose fields rocked many, and the Lord said, Thou fool. And he says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. No, I don't know about anybody, but one thing I know, I take every word in the Bible. So it, it is not he that layeth up treasure. It's he that layeth up treasure for himself. Amen. So the, 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 I think the problem was not the man break it, be, tearing down the barn and building bigger barns. Why? Because he did not grow one of those plants. It is just God who sent rain and gave favor atmosphere. If God didn't want the man to have 50 ton of corn, he would not have given him 50 ton of corn. And God would not want him to have 50 ton of corn and 30 ton spoil in the field because he didn't want to keep it. So putting it up was not against God's plan. But the man says, soul, take thy ease. So he said, my soul is resting on my 50 ton of corn. Instead of resting on God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Sister Zoe, you had something to say? You said it. Okay. So the call to salvation is for everyone. The call to service is for those who have obeyed the call to salvation. Amen. Now verse 2. And I'm going to do just verse 2 and verse 3. Because it's 8, 8, 30, no, so I'll stop here tonight. He said mercy unto you. Amen. So what he's saying. That understand this. You are not here. Because you are good and nice. You are not here because your mother was one of the prayer warriors in the church. You are not here because your father gave some money to help to build or your brother is a pastor. You are here because of the mercy of God. I want us to understand because while we preach the gospel of salvation according to Acts 2 38, understand. That the action only works if, the, if God accepts it. So God made it possible for us to come to him through the Acts 238 formula. There was nothing that Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Peter or David did that could have made that possible. God just chose that way. Is there another way? No, there is not. Why did God choose that day? Check me the day after we get to heaven. I'll ask him for you and then I'll tell you. Because right now I don't know. One thing I know, it works. Amen? It works. So, God, it, Jude wants us to understand. So, first thing, he kind of levels down his tone status. Don't look at me. Listen to me. Then he points out that you have to follow a path to get into the favor of God. You have to, ask, you have to accept his calling to salvation. You have to serve Christ Jesus. And then you have to be willing to be used where he places you. But all this is because of God's mercy. Amen. Praise God. But that the mercy is unto us. But then he said, out of that mercy, peace and love be what? Multiplied. No, Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. He's talking to the 12 disciples. But Jude is saying that peace must be multiplied. Means that if he leaves his peace with me, I have enough peace for myself. When I start to multiply, I must be taking that message of peace to others. As you can see in uh, Nahum chapter 1 verse 15, I think it is. Oh, beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them. 
that bring good tidings, that talk about peace, that say to Zion, thy God reigneth. The person who truly experiences the love of Jesus must have a multiplication of that love because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. We must be willing at all times to multiply to others. I cannot be a Christian if I cannot show you the peace of God that passes understanding and the love of God that brings salvation. Sister Zoe. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Uh, I was just asking, uh, the verse that you just referenced a while ago about, about peace, um, what came to mind was the verse also that when Jesus was leaving, he said that he was going to leave them with a comforter. Is there any way that, I know that you're good at like translations and stuff like that, based on the original text, is it that it's talking about the Holy Ghost or is it talking about actual just peace and relaxation? But uh, well, he, uh, um, he said the comforter is the Holy Ghost. But like I said, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. But if that love be not multiplied, there is enough for me to pass on. If the peace is multiplied, God, what multiplication does, it increases. Amen? Amen. And so, um, so John, what you're quoting there is John 14, 27. Amen? But in Romans 5, verse 5, as I mentioned, you, we have that outpouring of others, of, to our, so the peace and love that we talk about must be multiplied. And like I said, Jude, remember we're talking about the, the, uh, the, the military strategy. Invade and hold, supply and replenish. Amen. So every time we get into a situation, we must first invade and hold. You get into a new job, you, we must bring the love of God and the peace of God into that situation. And then from that standpoint, it starts to grow. When you get into meetings and everybody is cussing at each other, but you can speak speak with the peace of God. After a time, I'm telling you, I'm experiencing, it's like you take over meeting and you're not even the chairman. You get into meeting and all of a sudden, no matter who is there, they want you to pray. And when I, I'm asked to pray in a meeting, I don't pray for us of a productive meeting. I pray for us of a meeting with respect for each other, where the peace of God prevails and the wisdom of God is dispensed. Amen? Amen? Praise God. So in verse 3, he said, he gave all diligence. So this is not just a cursory, how are you doing note? This is not just dropping a line to say, are you okay? This epistle, as short as it is, was a result of careful and considered study and deliberation. And I will end by saying this. If Jude gave our diligence to write, I expect he wants us to give our diligence to read. Amen. Amen. It would be Sister Sandra, you come home and you're tired, but you know you have to feed your family. So you get into the kitchen and you roll up your sleeves and you really put it on. And you lay it out on the table. And Alan come and look at it. I say, good night, darling. I'm asleep. And so you come. She, oh, what is this? Oh, it looks so. And she gone. How do you feel? I know how I'd feel. Hmm? And she wouldn't feel any way. She may not say it, she'd feel hurt. If you, if you put your heart in the prevail, sometimes people don't look, look as if. Yes, yes. yes. I remember one Father's Day, I got roundly rebuked. Because I'm not a gift person, I'm not an occasion person. 
one day to me just as good as another. But I was not appreciative of what I had been given. And I was wrong rebuke. And I was repenting dust and ashes. <laughs> so Jude said, I gave all diligence to write of the common salvation. It was needful. So as much as I was gearing up to write something, I, I didn't just want to write about the whole salvation experience. I want to point out something specific. It was needful to tell you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. So while we are equally saved by one gospel, the doctrine of predestination, which speaks of pre-selection by God, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which suggests levels of divine holiness and truth, are both rejected by the word of God. Philippians 2 verse 3 speaks against his predestination thing. Amen. And Revelation 2 verses 6 and 15, God speaks about the doctrine of Nicolaita, which he hates. Now many of us have heard about the predestination gospel. But let me tell you what the doctrine of Nicolaitans is. The doctrine of Nicolaitans came from a Greek um, mythological belief that the world was divided into what were called the Nikos, or the victorious ones, and the Latos, or the common man. Nikos is the same word from which we get the brand Nike. So the, it was said that every man in life was on a journey to climb Mount Olympus. And the Greek super god Zeus lived at the top of Mount Olympus. So those who were the Nikos had climbed Mount Olympus and had spoken with Zeus. You were no ordinary guy. So when, when, when Satan came in on, and tried to corrupt the early church, what he did was bring a certain level of pride. So you can imagine if he had his way, all people like Peter, nobody couldn't talk to him. You would have to make an appointment to see Peter's secretary. Much less to talk to him. Because this is a man who was with, can you imagine how John who lean on the Lord's breast? Man, they are not pretty. They're not walking people are fun him day and night. And so they were dividing the church. And God said, I hate it. Twice in the book of Revelation. There is no, while we have offices and we need to respect offices. God is no respecter of persons. I have the greatest of respect for our pastor, Pastor Leg. I will, I follow his leading and I would not speak ill against him for any reason. But in the eyes of God, he is no greater than I am. But God has placed him in a certain position. We're going to see later when I talk about those who speak evil of dignities. Because they don't want to be under any leadership. We're going to talk about those who perish right about the gain saying of course who did not want to be under Moses' leadership. We're not going to get there tonight. But I want us to understand this. That we have a common salvation. And we must, he said we must earnestly contend. So while salvation is freely offered, it is not without opposition. Believe you me, you have to fight to ask to be baptized in Jesus' name. You have to fight to even come to the altar, much less to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. People sit down there and feel the urging of God and they grab until the chair till the plastic crack. Can they not? You know, sister Witter? Is she talk about 
Oh, she, when she come and she, when, she, when she feel the food, she put down the food and the next one lift up and God will help her out and she will resist. You know, Sister Paulette, how oh, she said, who will have She said, nah, go on the altar. And I remember someone else testified them what it was. That says they're not going to the altar. And all when them reach the altar, they must say they're not going to the altar. It's better than It's a fight. And that is why we have to be very careful, especially young converts, because they're fighting to get it. All you want to do is say the wrong thing. I'll do the wrong thing. I see it. And you see it, I tell you. I hear it. Amen. Earn a second. And listen, I don't care how long you've been in this thing. It's still a fight. It's still a fight. This year is 30 years. And I'm still fighting. And I think I remember saying when we were doing the art of war. That every day. Every moment of every day. Every child of God is at war. The war doesn't start when they get up in the morning. The war starts when you're supposed to wake up and pray. When you're supposed to wake up and read the Bible. The war starts when you're supposed to come to prayer meeting. The war starts when you get up in the morning, Saturday, Saturday night, and you hang up your clothes to wear, and then you get up Saturday morning and say, I don't like that dress there. War! So you waste another 10 minutes just deciding to wear the same dress we had decided from Saturday night. And while he might delay you at home, he might have some taxi man, he might set out a road. Because he, he, just, he, he just want one of them road at the back of your car. And by the end, got police station service done. War! I remember one morning I was rushing here. And let me tell you how this thing works. You know, my car is well, my car is manual. So I'm starting the car in the morning. And I'm I have to push on the, the clutch to start the car. And I pushed on the clutch and I realized that the socks I had had streaks at the side. And the one on this foot didn't have any. And some said, go back inside, go look for a proper pair of socks. Well, thankfully, I don't wear very short pants. I don't think anybody noticed. <laughs> war. I normally drive with a bottle of water. And I'm backing out the garage and the, and the enemy say, you left your water. Amen. Earnestly content. And finally, as we close, he said, the faith that was once delivered. There has been no change or evolution of the doctrinal teachings and values that God expects from his people. There is no new revelation. What was delivered to the initial 120 on the day of Pentecost over 2,000 years ago is what still obtains today. Amen. And note that it's not just a doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation is for sinners to become saved. But the doctrine of holiness is for saints to remain saved. The Bible is like brute beasts. They defile themselves. We're going to see it right here in Jude. Amen. So we are contending for the faith. Not a faith, not some faith. When you use the, what you call the definite article, the, it means there is only one. We talk about a member of parliament, but the prime minister. Because there is only one. There are 63 members of parliament, but only one prime minister, one governor general. So you don't say, a governor general. You said the governor general. 
So we must earnestly contend for the faith. And I want to say as I close, if you don't know what the faith is, pray about it and ask. Amen? Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. And so we end there for tonight. Praise God. And we pick it up next week. Let, I must say I am so pleased by the turnout tonight. I am so pleased. Praise God. This is a very good way to start the year. Bless the Lord. Thanks, thanks. I give you thanks for all you have done. I am so, oh, my soul is at rest. Oh, Lord, I give you thanks. Thanks, thanks, I give you thanks for all you have done. I am so blessed, my soul is at rest, oh Lord. I give you thanks. Praise the Lord. So I want to thank the Lord for bringing us out tonight. I also want to thank the Lord for our new converts that are here. Praise the Lord. Sister Terian. I smiled when I saw her. And also Brother Cheyenne around there. Praise the Lord. Bless God. We want to um, please remember in your time of prayer to pray for Sister Lily Scott. Praise the Lord as... Um, she is craving our prayers as it relates to healing. And brother, prayer for Brother Dennis also. Praise the Lord. Remember our short teens and also those who are grieving. Oh, and as thank you, Lord, for reminding me. As we're saying thanks, I just want to thank the Lord for allowing the Ellis family to be new parents. Praise the Lord. Sister Chanel and Brother Andrew with their nice baby girl. Praise God. God has been good. And we want to bear Sister Williams in our prayers. Praise the Lord. Bless God. So we'll soon get that good news. Praise God. So now we're going to ask the control, William. <laughs> I wonder if Deacon, you look like you're sweating a while ago. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So also pray for Deacon Williams. <laughs> Bless God. So he's going to be praying at this time. Lord Jesus, we thank you for allowing us to be here. We thank you for giving us another chance on the face of this earth. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what we have learned tonight. I pray, Jesus, that whatsoever we have learned tonight will not leave us, Lord. I pray the adversary will not come and steal away the word from our hearts. Jesus, I pray, guard whatever we have learned, because we know that your word is there to deliver us in times of need, Lord God. I pray you continue to bless, Lord God, the teacher, continue to inspire him, continue to use him, continue to give us understanding hearts and minds, that we can eh, receive your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray you bless each and every individual that is here tonight, those who are unable to make it, remember them too. Lord, even now, as we are about to depart from this place, I pray you go with us. Take us safe home. You brought us here safe, so we are depending on you to take us back. Lord Jesus, thank you again. For everything good that you have done for us. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. And being that we are in the book of Jude, we're going to be doing our benediction from Jude, verse 24 and 25. After three, 
Praise the Lord. Two, three. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Greet each other before you leave.